Off the top at six, another family member has been charged in the death of a 15-year-old boy with special needs in Muskegon County. This comes just a week after the boy's mother was charged with murder in the boy's death. 20-year-old Paul Ferguson was arraigned today on a charge of first-degree child death. Either 43-year-old Shanda Vander Ark was charged with open murder and child in the days after she remains in jail. From law clerk to lockup, Shonda Vander Ark is finally on trial for turning her home into a house of nightmares. It is what literal horror movies are made out of. And we're going to talk about that in the trial in today's video. <laughs> Hello Sofa Squad, welcome back to the sofa today. Sofa's back there with Mr. Roscoe and my name's Paul if you're not familiar with the channel. Now like I said, today we're going to be discussing a trial a case uh, and this is the one against Shonda Vander Ark. Now before we even get into anything, please be advised this is a very sensitive video. This might not be for everybody, so trigger warning galore. This is going to be dealing with extreme conversations about very heinous acts that she did and had her older son commit against a young son and sibling in the household so if this video isn't for you I totally understand but just know that going forward and what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off the video with some just backstory of kind of like how we arrived at this trial who everybody is that type thing and then we're gonna go into some highlights and whatnot of the trial like opening statements some text messages uh, the son taking the stand against his mother things of this nature I'll react to some of the pieces and talk about it and add some commentary along the way now do keep in mind y'all I'm not a doctor I'm not a lawyer I'm none that fancy credentialed stuff okay I'm just a guy with a sofa a dog and some opinions on true crime so literally these are just my opinions do with that what you will now also if you do want to follow me on social media platforms outside of here I'm mostly on Instagram so you can check me out over there and uh, the thing is on the screen and it's in the description below so come on check it out over there now like I said what I want to do with this video is I want to start off by talking about who she is and how we arrived in this horrifying situation. Timothy Ferguson was only 15 years old when he lost his life in the most brutal of ways. He is the son to Shonda Vander Ark, who is the trial we're talking about. He is the brother to Paul Ferguson. That is Shonda's other son, her older son, who has also been charged, but we'll talk about that as well. Uh, that's a very complicated situation as well. Now, Shonda has been charged with first degree child abuse and open murder for Timothy's death. But look, she's not the only one that stands accused of these actions. Like I said, her other son, Paul, is the co-accused. He was 20 years old and was charged with one count of first-degree child abuse and his sibling's death. Now, Paul has been offered this basically plea deal to give his testimony in exchange for essentially a lighter sentence that he'll get. Now, like I said, we'll talk more about Paul along the way and you'll see him testify and you'll probably understand a little bit what I'm talking about because he does appear to be a victim in this case as well at his mother's hands. It is all around tragic, the depths of depravity that this woman's actions have reached and obviously took one of her son's lives. Paul, the things that he was made to do, I, I, I can't imagine imagine the, the things that he'll have to live through and work through the rest of his life. So I want to start the video off by just doing some backstory about who she was. And here's the thing with Shonda. If you were to go just by like her resume, her credentials, all this type of stuff, you'd be like, this woman's like this really intelligent, successful scholar. She's done all these great things, but there are two sides to her. So she spent 2018 to 2021 studying at Western Michigan University Cooley Law School. Now she served as a treasurer, senator, wellness liaison and budget committee leader for the West Michigan Student Bar Association. She's even been honored with a Leadership Achievement Award. So look, after graduating in 2021, she became employed as a law clerk for Muskegon County Circuit Judge Annette Smedley. But at home, things were far from normal. Things were far from successful. Her house has been described as like a demented Harry Potter chamber where her son was forced to live. It was bad. She had cameras all over the house. And now look, in this day and age, I get it. I have cameras all over here as well. That can be normal, but she didn't have them for normal reasons. She had them for very sinister ones, and they were to guard her son, 
Timothy and to watch his every single move. She had a camera installed in his bedroom, which was literally no more than like a tarp in a closet. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. The door was even set with an alarm at nighttime, so he was unable to go use the bathroom. And she would monitor these cameras like a hawk at work, texting back and forth with her son Paul all day long, instructing him what to do and what type punishments to inflict. Even her boss was like, girl, what, what's up? You're glued to these cameras. Now, here's the thing. Timothy was special needs. He was autistic. He had a speech and motor impairment and some mental disabilities. He didn't attend school and it was instead being homeschooled. Now, we'll talk more about that as we get into it, what his homeschool consisted of, but let's just say he was not being homeschooled, okay? He was one of these unfortunate victims who is able to skate by on the radar, or I should say his parents are, his mother is, by homeschooling. None of the such was going on. Now, prosecutors would say his body was only 69 pounds when he was found, and the medical examiner would determine that he died of a combination, hypothermia and malnourishment. Now, even the day before his death, he was barely able to move. He was shaking, and finally, this would alarm Paul, but unfortunately, his mother, as well as he, under her direction, basically determined that he was faking these symptoms and didn't believe him. And of course, the next day, he would would finally succumb to the torture that he had been inflicted to. Now this part does come with a trigger warning and we'll hear more of this when we get into the testimony from Paul when he takes the stand. But I want to talk momentarily about just some of these punishments that were utilized against poor little Timothy. She would have Paul make sure he couldn't fall asleep, taunt him with food, give him ice cold baths, force vomiting, excessive exercising, prolonged standing, and he was regularly restrained with zip ties and shackles. In fact, on the day that Timothy lost his life, Paul was in instructed to give him an ice bath that lasted for four hours. And then after Paul was taken to work by his mother, his mother continued the ice bath to like 1130 that night. It went on for like nine hours. Paul worked at Applebee's as a dishwasher at the nighttime shift. His mother worked at the court. She worked from like six in the morning until six in the evening. So basically their schedules were such that somebody was always at home to watch him, but not just watch him, but torture him, punish him, keep their eye on him and treat him like a prisoner. Now, Paul will say the only reason he did these things is because because he was instructed to do so by his mother. I have no doubt that she had a crazy amount of control over everyone in that house, and they probably all were extremely afraid of her. Now, here's the thing. The diet that he was allowed when he was allowed to eat consisted mostly of bread soaked in hot sauce. This was used as a form of punishment. Now, if he was good, he could use, like, regular bread after that, but very rarely was he allowed to have, like, what we would consider regular food. So, Vander Ark had custody of the children. Now, there was a divorce. There's a tumultuous custody battle, but at this point, she had custody of the kids. Now, we'll talk here in a little bit about her history because she was very close to losing custody in another state, but she seems to have learned how to work the system. Now, the father who lives in Florida, he was unaware of this level of abuse that was going on. Now, like I said, this took place in Norton Shores, Michigan, but Shonda had a lot of other addresses and a lot of history. In fact, she had 18 previous addresses between Oklahoma and Virginia. Now, the neighbors said that they really had no idea what was going on. They really considered them recluses. They rarely ever saw them outside of the home. And this is another thing we often hear with this level of abuse where there's hiding and that type of thing. And we'll hear more testimony about the only times that Timothy was even allowed to go outside. Now, like I said, Shonda had issues with CPS before. So back in Oklahoma, instead of the courts getting to terminate her parental rights, she chose to just leave the home. And now the court allowed Vander Ark only supervised visitation, but it looks like that was only like limited to a at 1.3 hours per month. Now, also to note, at the time of the crime, there was another seven-year-old brother living in the house, but there is seemingly no abuse reported with him. So now that we have some of that background information, okay, let's go ahead and take a minute and look at the opening statements. Now, as we see in these trials, this is the time for the defense and the state to argue their cases and kind of lay out the direction that they're going to take and whatnot. And we're going to hear from both sides. Now, as usual, the state has a lot to say, and the defense really doesn't have that much to say. Now, as we're going to see in these clips as we go through, we will soon learn that, yeah, there's not really much to say. The evidence, as they say, is stacked against Shanda. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this by just looking at some clips, and I'm going to do commentary and that type thing on it as we go. The how of this begins to unfold on July 6th of 2022 when police officers from the Norton Shores Police Department are dispatched to 4788 Marshall Road in Norton Shores. The first officer on scene is there. ProMed's already on scene. 
and they've already found Timothy Ferguson deceased in the basement level of that home. You're going to see photographs of that home. It's a bi-level home, and Timothy Ferguson is in the basement of that home. By the time the officer arrives, Timothy Ferguson is deceased and has been deceased for some time. Now, as you heard the state here, this is the basics of the case. The, you know, we're entering in through the eyes of the officers and that type thing into the scene that they're walking into. And obviously we tragically know now that Timothy, his life, he did not make it. Now, once we begin to hear the things that were going on in this house, it's like, whoa. Now, one thing I want you to do as we listen to this is for myself watching it and then also reading comments and stuff like that, you know, the son, Paul, the older son who has also been charged uh, in this case. Uh, he is going to be testifying against his mother. We will be reviewing some of his testimony. Keep in mind with the way the prosecution kind of lays him out because essentially, you know, they're saying that he's the strong arm or whatnot. We'll watch that clip in a minute. Yeah, but when you're watching Paul testify, there's this part where you're just like, my God, this kid is just, you know, he's a young adult at this point, but he was, you know, a teenager then. And regardless, you can kind of see where it's like, uh, this guy's like a victim of his mother as well, right? I, I just think that he was very afraid of her and that this was a motivating factor for him to carry out some of the actions that he did against his brother. But we'll review that as we come to it. Now let's go ahead and listen and get a little bit more deeper into what the state's going to be laying out. The pieces of that puzzle start to unfold as the police investigation does. Officer Stefanich begins to notice, in addition to the shocking image of Timothy Ferguson, deceased, other things unusual in the home. There's leg cuffs in the basement. There's cameras everywhere. There's hot sauce in the bathroom. Upstairs in the upper level of the home, there's locks on the refrigerator and the freezer. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. The things that were going on in this house, that's why I'm calling it Mom's House of Horrors. I mean, it is insane. Now, it's also insane about this case, and the state will lay it out, and we'll see it as we review this case and this trial, is just the text message evidence alone, which we'll look at just some of it, is so incriminating. I can't believe she took it to trial. I can't believe she got on the stand. Yes, we will be going over that too. I mean, it is so bad. And so you're hearing this, the state, again, through the eyes of the officer, he's walking this jury through you know okay what's what's this hot sauce for the locks the this the that and one thing to keep in mind too is this was a special needs child that we will find out has many of the same diagnoses as, as shanda shanda and so you're just like what you know if you allegedly are going through some of the same stuff that your son is do you think you need to be treated the same you know and you'll see her as well a tr completely try and lie and squirm her way out of this. It's actually rather disgusting if you ask me. But anyways, let's, let's go on to that next clip. And in the basement, as if part of some demented version of Harry Potter, there's a small closet, again, with an alarm on the door. Now, this is one thing, and, you know, that really stuck out to me that I wanted to put it in there, like some demented Harry Potter thing. You know, when we see these cases where one child has been singled out in the home and their siblings living there and whatnot, and especially when the parent is making siblings engage in the treatment of the, the child, I, I just, my heart breaks for them because I'm like, okay, in addition to going through the physical, mental, emotional turmoil that they're being put through you then have this level of there has to be in their, their mind why me why is my brother my sister whoever why do they get to have a normal life why me what is it about me and so that dynamic right there is absolutely heartbreaking to me the bathroom camera is literally a motion tracking camera and the officer notices as soon as he walks into the bathroom that the camera starts to follow his motion Again, hot sauce in the bathroom. Why is there hot sauce in the bathroom? These are all questions at the time the police officers have, but they have no explanation for most of it. All they know is that Timothy Ferguson died as a result of malnutrition. Now, the part about going into the bathroom and seeing the camera start to follow you around creeped out. I mean, all of it does, obviously. I'm thinking through the eyes of the officers, and they're walking into the scene, and it's just, you know, and it all starts to come together. Like, you know, why are there cameras in the bathroom? That right there would send off a red flag. And then when we learn what the hot sauce is used for, you know, they had to have just been like, what? And again, here's this child, malnourished, hypothermia, and it's like, what? How does this even happen? 
happen. And the excuses that she will cough up, most of which are being pointed at her other son, Paul, they're not flying. More statements coming out from Ms. Van der Ark about some of the unusual things in the home. The leg cuffs. Oh, those are, those are Paul Ferguson. Paul Ferguson is the older boy that lives in the house. He's 19 at the time. And you're going to hear from Paul Ferguson. And I'm just going to tell you right now, you're not going to like Paul Ferguson. I don't like Paul Ferguson. Paul Ferguson was a contributing factor to the death of his brother. Now, this is the part that I was talking about when he lays out the case about Paul. And I'm going to be very interested to see. I do not know at the time of this recording. I know that he has been offered a deal to testify against his mother for lesser charges. Now, I don't know if he's going to just plea out to those or take it to trial or whatever he's going to do. So, that being said, I am very curious if it goes to trial how he would fare because I really do think a lot of people watching this or watching his demeanor, his fear of his mother being in the same room room with her seeing that there's a little something going on with him and, and again the context of it he is under her care she's telling him to do these things and now blaming him for them you know so i'm very curious to see how his trial will go because you know yes are some of the acts that he did against but not some of them all of the acts that he did against his brother uh, horrifying yes absolutely yes do i think he holds the same evil as his mother does no i do not for all intents and purposes, Timothy Ferguson was a prisoner in his own home. He never went to a doctor. He never went to school. The only time he was allowed to leave the house was if he was being punished and he had to run up and down the stairs in the backyard where nobody could see him or walk the dog in the backyard again where nobody could see him. Now keep this information in mind as we watch the trial go through this because these things that he's throwing out there, the things that were taking place, Shonda has come up with every excuse under the sun. She has it laid out for every single thing. She's got a reasoning for it. And, you know, watching it, I personally feel like I see right through it. Some of the stuff you could be like, okay, well, maybe I could see if you, you know, transferred a child from another parent, you might have a, a, a you know, a, a downtime in getting them into school or some medical treatment, but you'll hear here where she just kind of like, mm, well, couldn't do it. So yeah, we just, he didn't go to school. Yeah, we just, we quit taking him to the doctor because of so-and-so or this. It's not my fault, you know, is the whole thing. And then these punishments that are laid out, again, she'll blame most of it on her other son, Paul. And then number two, uh, uh, and all odds stacked against her with blatant text messages that, again, we're going to review here momentarily. She will just, the only thing you can see is, I don't remember. You know, that's literally all you can say because the evidence is so damning. Again, I'm still baffled that she took this to trial. Now, let's take a minute and let's hear from... From her defense attorney now she has history with him remember that she has worked at this courthouse right she's been there okay she's probably past these judges and all these people in the hallways so that part's kind of like Ugh. you know this goes to show you never know what's going on behind closed doors or you know with somebody internally you know for all seeming reasons she was this put together person who went to school and did all this stuff and all that but then literally at home this horrifying stuff is going on so anyways let's hear the defense attorney and his opening statements and what he has to say. One of the things he, he did talk about was what the statute says. And the judge read you this morning, so read you again. The word, the exact word of the statute for this type of crime is knowing and intentional. My God, I knew that word intentional was going to creep up. It's like Sarah Boone has just come into every single case we do now. And I get what he's saying, but it's just that word is just stained in my brain now. But, you know, obviously he is going to be wanting to sway the jury that she didn't know this was going to happen. And this wasn't her intentions. And, you know, that kind of changes the game. But, uh, yeah. you know, nice try, buddy. I get it. It's your job. You're doing what you got to do. I respect the game. However, the text message evidence that we will see the state rake her over with and make her read there's no getting around it it was intentional so this is this is what they're thinking at the time this is what's going in there all the, all the things that are going in there is <coughs> raw and it's real and it's unedited go find those text messages and what you're going to hear over and over again over and over as you listen to these messages is my client Shonda Vandar 
and her oldest son, Paul Ferguson, had no idea that they were hurting this boy. This is the part that will forever blow my mind and the psychological aspect of it and trying to figure out how you can be doing this stuff to someone in your home and then it escalates to the point of that person losing their life and you're like, what? Well, I, I didn't, I, I wasn't meaning to do that. We didn't know that we were hurting them. What did you think you were doing? What was the end game? That's where with these cases like this, I'm just like, you know, what was the end game? Okay, you're sitting here trying to say that, you know, you're working, you're doing this, you can't monitor the child, he's he's a handful, you need your older son to do it, husband's out of the picture now, you know, whatever the excuses are. Okay, what's the end game? What's the end game? You know, <laughs> I mean, people grow up and keep going. Were you just going to jail him the rest of his life? You know, did you not think that at some point this would come to a crashing end or that his harm would get to such a point that he would lose his life? Like, I, I mean, I guess that's just my question is what, obviously what were they thinking? But, you know, what's the purpose? Where did you think it was going to lead? You know, and then to sit here and just kind of come up with, oh, we didn't know that it was harming him. Who in their right mind inflicts this kind of stuff on somebody and then turns around and says, I didn't think it was harming them. The punishments that she came up with for him are, they're not even punishments, it's torture, okay? It's next, nobody thinks of this stuff. Who decides to force feed their kid hot sauce as a punishment while starving them? I mean, that is like the last thing that I would ever think of. And you know what this case reminds me of so much, which is so bizarre, and it really makes you sit here and say, thank God it didn't get to this point, is the trial that we just watched, the Boy in the Box trial. And I can't remember off the top of my head right now, but we just finished doing this, we covered it over here, and the father has been convicted and sent away. Now, not for, not for that long, to be quite honest. The child, the victim survived in that case. It did not escalate to this point, but you see how it does all these same similarities you know the the locks and the doors and all this kind of stuff and so it's a slippery slope is what i'm getting at and this is a worst case scenario whereas the other case you know again luckily the child lived but this is where that downward slope to this you know and this is just next level and i just again i think that part of me you know i try to assign it reason and figure it out i think that's just part of being human and sometimes i guess i just have to realize that there is no figuring out people are just evil and they're just not thinking kind of a thing you know because i guess to me i sit here and just get lost in the thought of like like, again, like, what what were they thinking? Did they, you know, was there, like, a point where they say, oh, this will teach them and the kid will start behaving and then they won't have to do this again? You know, or are they just getting off on this? And so it was their thing to take all their frustrations with life out on this one person as the scapegoat, you know, I'll probably never know and probably don't want to ever be able to say, oh, yeah, I got it figured out now. That makes sense. But, there, but as you listen to Paul's testimony, and as you listen to my client's testimony, neither one of them are aware of what's obvious to him and you and him and all the rest of us. We're all going to see it. How could you not see it? But listen to it. They don't. They see it. They don't see the suffering. They don't see this. this, this is, they call what they're doing to him punishments, and they, they consider it in response to what but again, I beg to ask the question, who in their right mind comes up with these punishments? And as we'll learn with the testimony, there's so many things that she did in this that literally were self-sabotaging. You know, taking him off all of his medications, out of his doctor appointments, and she'll give excuses why she couldn't do this. And it's literally a joke, especially for somebody who works in the courthouse. I mean, this is the just like, girl, what were you thinking, okay? So, you know, with her attorney, I asked the question, you know, again, if they're not aware of it I mean, was this just like a regular day out of the week for them of, you know, oh, we, we have no self-awareness that we're harming him? I mean, you're literally watching someone die slowly in front of you at your hands. You'll, my client will take the stand, you'll find out she's a highly intelligent person. She went to law school. She passed the bar examination. 
oh yeah, she takes a stand all right, and whoa, Mama Jama, we're talking about that. I've never seen anything like it, and I was actually talking to somebody, we had a little chat going about it while it was going on, and we're watching it, and... I was sitting here and I was like, have you noticed how at the end of every year, there is some next level trial like this that comes out of the blue? Like I hadn't even heard of this case and it just started going and I'm like, what is the, what in the Leticia stock are we watching? Okay. It's next level. And it seems that at the end of every year, one of these cases pops up sadly enough. Right. But yeah, she takes a stand and oh yeah, we're going to spend some time on that. From her ex-husband. I'm putting Timothy out, the victim. You want him or he's going to, to protect your services. She takes him in. She takes him in. She takes him in, send him to me. He's trying to make her out like some savior. Now, all I'm hearing from this is I'm like, this poor boy to go through this, the feeling of unwantedness in this lifetime, right? He had, he had to have been prevalent in his thoughts and his, you know, whatever. You know, father sends him away, comes up here, he's tortured by his mother and brother. You know, what a horrible existence, you know? And I get the attorney, her defense has to paint her in the best light. It's what his job is. I respect that, you know? And it's like, okay, great. She took him in. She doesn't want to see him to go to CPS. Well, she almost lost her kids before this. The only reason she didn't is because she, you know, voluntarily left the home. She kind of knew how to slip through the cracks, in my opinion. Yeah, so it's not like this is just some, you know, little saint over here who just, you know, got a little bit overstressed and snapped okay this is old hat for her and poor tim is, is ends up paying the ultimate price but this isn't murder <coughs> this is not murder this is something's wrong but it's not murder and we're going to ask you to find my client not guilty thank you if that ain't the big M, I don't know what is, okay? And of course he's gonna ask to find her not guilty. I mean, that's what you have to do. Bless his heart. He was probably embarrassed to get up there and ask for it, you know? And he's gonna, you know, say that he sees her in a certain light and, you know, I don't see her in that way. And, you know, this isn't the person I know and that type stuff. And I mean, I, maybe it's not. People can wear many different facades. Yeah, but one thing to pay attention to as we go through this and the clips that we'll watch of her is just look at her body, her demeanor, her body language. You know, I said something to someone in the chat as well where I was like, just the way she sits there, especially when we see her on the stand and talking and interacting, everything about her is so intense and aggressive. It's like, I'm sitting here like, I can't imagine what she would be like on the streets, unfiltered and like mad at me or something like that. I mean, I'm just like, oh, whoa. So that being said, let's talk very quickly about some of this digital evidence and specifically the text messages. Because again, remember they had all these cameras and she's texting back and forth with Paul all day long, you know, taking notes on what Timothy's doing, telling him how to punish Timothy and then watching on the cameras. I mean, it seemed literally like a sick kind of like interactive TV show to her, right? But let's talk about what was in some of those text messages and then specifically after that or during that conversation, we're gonna talk about her reaction to the text messages being read out loud. Now keep in mind for the clips we're gonna watch, there's two, there's a detective and an officer sitting in the court in the stand. The male officer is reading the voice of Paul and the female is reading the voice of Shanta. So just keep that in mind, that's what we're seeing when this goes on. Now these clips are from Court TV. If you wanna watch a bunch of the highlights and whatnot, definitely check them out. Channel 13 also did the trial in full if you wanna watch the whole thing. So just keep that in mind, but but these are from Court TV. If you want to see the full thing or whatever without my commentary, go check out Court TV. Now let's go ahead and watch that first clip. Find out what he has snuck right the heck now. Because I know he has snuck stuff since you weren't doing what you were supposed to. What do you mean you didn't know he was awake? You both should have been awake at 1030. I am not happy. You know he wasn't just sitting there. Check the brownies in the kitchen. Check everything not locked away check where the flipping keys have been. So one major aspect to the torture that was being inflicted upon Timothy was food control. And as you heard and hear these text messages, you know, her flipping out over the food and whatnot. You know, one thing that goes to my mind when I'm listening to these cases like this, especially these ones with children involved and these like OCD control things that the parents do, you know, is the food control. I don't understand. And especially when you see other children in the house allowed to kind of do what they want to do, but one is singled 
out. The, they become like the, the scapegoat for the family or whatever. And it seems like that was the case with Timothy. Now, like I said, the food control is a major thing. They had the fridge locked, all this stuff locked up. You heard her say, where are the keys? You know, where's this, that? So she has everything locked up. Now, again, like I said previously, his main diet that he was allowed was literally a form of punishment. And that was like bread soaked in this hot sauce. Now we'll hear testimony in a little bit from Paul on the stand where he'll say, yeah, sometimes they just dumped the hot sauce straight in his mouth. You know, now if he was good and would eat the bread soaked in hot sauce, it's like his punishment. He would then be allowed to eat just like regular bread, you know, and this was like a treat. Check his breath. I can almost guarantee he's eaten something. He was chewing on something when he walked downstairs. You and I will be talking about this on a later date when we're both home. Now, like I said, and as you can see that, you know, their schedules aligned and such, they really weren't home that often together. So this worked out to where Paul is at home during the daytime to watch them. She's at home during the evening time. So it was like handing off this, you know, torch of abuse being inflicted upon him. Now, one thing to pay attention in this is notice at the very end of that clip where she says, you and I, you know, I'm not happy with you. We're going to talk at a later date when we're home alone. You know, when you see Paul on the stand and you can tell there's probably some things going on with him, I can only imagine being in this situation and being so afraid of your mother or whoever is inflicting this upon you in the household that there's a level of, I don't want that attention turned to me. So I'm going to have to comply you know, type of situation. And when you see him on the stand, we'll get to those in a few minutes. You know, you can see him looking over at her, still very fearful. I mean, she's sitting right across from him, right? He's shackled up, you know, being incarcerated. And she's sitting right over there. It has to be scary as you know what. So hearing this and hearing her threaten him, like, we're going to talk, we're going to do this. You know, there had to have been this level of like, I, I, I don't want what's happening to my brother to happen to me. And this is where I was talking about this level of just, damage to everyone in the family unit takes place when a parent or guardian or whatever is inflicting this type of suffering on everyone in the household. Okay, now what I want to do is, like I told you, she has a panic attack in the courtroom hearing this, okay? So we're going to watch this take place because I was like, oh my God, can't roll my eyes hard enough. Let's watch it and then we'll talk about it. Maybe 10 minutes, so I'll have you up for tired of the jury room. Please rise. All right, maybe see you. Uh, just for purposes of the record, uh, Mr. Roberts and Mr. Johnson uh, had a sidebar with the court and indicated, Mr. Johnson indicated that his client was suffering some uh, distress, uh, specifically a panic attack, and he asked for five minutes. I think that's um, reasonable. So at this point in time... Makes me sick to my damn stomach. I mean... Honestly, it, and this is the thing when I see stuff like this, it just flies all over me because you, 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 you're at least for me, my first thing is, what, what did you give him? Did you give Timothy a five minute breather when he was, you know, panicking? It's suffering your, at your hands. Did he get this level of treatment? You know, and here's the thing can you imagine? sitting in the courtroom in front of a jury, having this evidence read out of the horrendous things that you have done. Hearing this kind of stuff, I'm like, I hang your head in shame. Plead guilty immediately just to get out of that. You know what I'm saying? So this part just turned my stomach because again, all this is coming out. What do you say to this? The evidence is right here. You can't lie your way out of this. So this part right here honestly turned my stomach, y'all. I'm not going to lie. I was ready to come through the TV over this and we'll see some other stuff along the way that kind of circles back to the special treatment and this type of stuff where I'm like, you know, again, the victims never get this kind of treatment and the perpetrators who inflict this type of stuff on the victims always seem to need this special treatment but are so unwilling to give it. Now, another thing that was interesting about this trial was watching the co-accused Shonda's son, Paul, take the stand against his mother. Now, keep in mind, like I've said before, he has been offered a deal to plead to lesser charges or to take get charged with lesser charges and, you know, exchange for 
for his uh, testimony against his mother. So there's that. Now, one thing as we watch this, again, watch his demeanor, the way he answers questions, the way he processes things, the way he glances over at his mother, because remember, he's right there. Okay, so this part to me is like, whoa, that would be so scary, especially knowing the history. So just pay attention to those things as we watch it. Um, he was sneaking food that was not necessary at that time and it was solved by placing locks on the fridge, freezer, and pantry. When you say he was sneaking food that wasn't necessary, who would make that determination that it wasn't necessary? Shonda. Okay, so right off the bat, let's get into the food control. This is a huge dynamic that will play out, and he, the state will rip her to pieces on the stand over this because there's no getting around this. They literally used food as punishment and control against him. Now, you heard Paul just say he was taking unnecessary food. Just that statement alone, right there, he was eating things that were unnecessary. What? Now, we'll also hear from Shonda. We're going to hear from her later talking about her excuse as to why this this took place, which is he was eating raw chicken nuggets, which could have killed him, and things of this nature, or taking, you know, Paul's Pop-Tarts. And so, again, the answer was to do this lockdown system. And again, you have to ask yourself these things. Think in a, a normal, regular situation of you have a child that has some kind of food issue. Take everything else out of it. You've got a kid living in your house got some kind of food issue, whether they're eating until they get sick or not wanting to eat, whatever. To this extent of I'm going to lock down the house with alarms and things like that and it's just it's insane okay now also on top of that they're utilizing food as punishment with the bread and the hot sauce you know literally this is this kid's diet it's like bread and hot sauce of course he's going to want unnecessary food right he's starving you know now again you heard at the very end who made that decision shonda you know I would question myself, would Paul have come up with all of this stuff on his own had it not been for his mother? And another thing I'm curious to hear in the comment section that I'm curious about is when I watch him and see how kind of timid and fearful he seems to be, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, I think this dude was trying to survive, right? And it was like his mom is sitting here saying, do this, do that, do this, do that. And he's like, look, I don't want her to do that to me. You know, so I'm going to, you know, do this to, you know, I'm going to go along with type situation and we'll hear the state kind of tear his story apart too in regard to why he didn't do some things and did other things but when i saw his demeanor because i was expecting someone to be like on the same level as like evil and conniving that i sense from her and i i don't sense that from him no i don't like his actions obviously you know but i just i'm not sensing that from him so i'm curious if y'all get that same sense or not or is it just me let me know in the comments but let's go into that next clip for now as far as you know, from the time that Timothy came to live with you in May of 2021 in Norton Shores to the time of his death, did you ever see Timothy go to a doctor? No. Did Timothy go to school? Not public, no. How was he schooled? Home. Now, this is another thing right here that's just heartbreaking because we see this happen in so many of these cases of children who are homeschooled and they it, this enables the abuse to take place and whatnot. It's absolutely just, it's heartbreaking. We're going to hear many excuses come out on the stand from her as to why he wasn't in school. And again, it's a joke. It's a literal joke. It's almost like if you really wanted him to, you could have made this happen, but you just, for whatever reason, didn't. And again, for someone like her who's claiming to be so busy and so this and so that, and I got it all on my own and my husband's gone and all this. And I'm just like, why wouldn't you take the time to get this situated? And then he could have been at school doing, you know, out of your hair, basically. You know, that's what blows my mind. I'm like, it could have done things to get him out of the house and been in some form of care that you weren't going to have to be doing this stuff that you're claiming pushed you to the edge, basically. I mean, she didn't say that, but it's the sense that I get that she wants people to think of like, oh, I just broke down and yeah, have PTSD or whatever. Um, it, it just, it, none of it makes sense. Um, there's been some testimony already about Timothy going on a hunger strike around the time of Adam's stroke. To your knowledge, did <coughs> Timothy ever go on a hunger strike when Adam had his stroke? No, sir. There's also a reference to him going on another hunger strike about two weeks before he passed away. Did, <coughs> excuse me, did that happen? No, sir. No, as you saw, so you see him looking over. Now, I think, okay, so if I'm him and he looks this way, I'm trying to do it. I think he's looking at his mother. I think she's sitting this way to him. I'm not sure. I think the jury is this way. 
I could be wrong in the courtroom, but just looking at like the dynamics when I see him sit there. So that was one of the things that, remember, she was having him lie and cover up evidence and all that kind of stuff. Well, obviously sitting here saying he's on a hunger strike would explain away why the kid was 69 pounds when he died of malnourishment, you know. So what teenage boy do you know is going to go on a damn hunger strike, right? This is not the average type thing. Now, I'm not trying to sit here and say anything for those who do do that. But in this scenario here, it's like, no, you put him on that hunger strike, you know, by feeding him bread and the hot sauce, you know, it's punishment. I mean, it's sadly, he probably savored every last bit of it because it was the only nutrients he was getting. And what, what was the restriction on Timothy's movement that would cause those cameras to go off? Where was he limited to? Could you please reiterate? Yeah. Where is it that, where could Timothy go, basically? Um, Mainly, he was restricted to the downstairs area, to a closet downstairs. Now, you heard him say, could you reiterate, or whatever it is that he says, and I'll say this a lot, and oftentimes you see him, he's kind of squirming in the chair, and I mean, I doubt he's comfortable, obviously. I mean, he's shackled up, right, in this wooden chair, sitting there with his mom across the room. But, you know, when he asks these questions, and you sit here and see him processing it, and a lot of times, they don't seem to be real tricky questions to me. Like, when he'll say, could you reiterate? I'm like, I'm not sure how he doesn't understand this, or whatever. And this is what I'm talking about. He comes across as somebody who I'm like, looking okay so watch him and his mom interact i'm like oh she probably could manipulate him all day long and run circles around him and get him to do whatever she wanted to do this is probably a walk in the park for her the defendant indicated was timothy's bunk bed is that correct yes sir where did he actually sleep most nights in the closet this and how what, what did you call the closet was there a name you used to refer to the, the closet the small room what was in the small room if, if Timothy was in the small room? There was a camera monitoring him, even when he slept. Now again, the cameras, the alarms, and we'll hear her time on the stand where there's a big differentiation between cameras and motion sensors, or I'm sorry, alarms and motion sensors. But again, just hearing this stuff, and he talks about this so normal. Like, you can tell that the conversations between him and his mother, like this was so normalized to them about he couldn't get out of the shackles. You know, oh, he snuck up yesterday, or oh, he did this. Like, the whole thing is just twisted, right? But it's so, the normalization of it in conversations with so bizarre to me you know and just like how the you know but again if that's your world if that's what you're having to do to survive and make it through and i'm mostly speaking from his point of view right now from paul's point of view i'm sorry then he's probably just going to talk normal about it i'm gonna say like, okay well i had to come home and i had to do this you know type situation now remember nobody else seemingly knew this and what i mean neighbors people like that and we're going to hear testimony too about how she even had the mother-in-law on tracking the mother-in-law's movements so that when she would come over she could make sure that she wouldn't come in the house to you know pick up the they, there's a younger seven-year-old that was living there at the time making sure of that now she will claim this is because of a messy house doesn't want people to see it yeah you know, but that's an easy excuse because no there's really horrible things going on in there were, were there any restrictions on his movement inside the closet or was it he could move around however he wanted inside the closet there were restrictions what were the restrictions on his movement um Hands on his head, normally. Hands on his head, is that what you indicated? Yes. Was that was some form of discipline for him? Yes. On his knees and against a corner of a wall of the room. Can you imagine being punished? Hands on your head in the closet, watching you on camera, right? Again, just like that other, the trial that we watched in Florida, the boy in the box, and that lived in the garage. The same type stuff. I mean, I just you know, I look at myself and I'm like, okay, I mean, I'm in my forties, like on the other side of 45. And I'm like, you asked me to sit, stand up for too long. I mean, I, it gets painful. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If I sit for too long traveling the car, it gets pain. Like there's just things like that. Now I get the kid wasn't that old, but nonetheless, regardless, you're at home with people that your family that you're thinking love you. Like that has to be so twisted in of itself that are doing this torturous stuff to you. But then like these things of like, you can't even be in your room and they're making you do this. What's the point? You know, again, if he's this much of a behavioral issue, why sit here and do this crazy stuff to him? Like when he's in his room, it's like, 
just, you know, if you're going to go that to those lengths, it's like, well, why don't you just put them in his room if you're just going to lock them away and then just let them be? You know what I'm saying? But they take it this next step of this torturous stuff while he's even in his room away from them, not bothering them. But the, the small room that you've described, at some point in time, there was a, uh, a, a tarp placed in there. Is that right? Yes, sir. And what was the reason there was a tarp placed in that room? Due to Timothy's bladder problem, Shonda didn't want him urinating on the floor. Would that be something that he would do? Yes. Would Did he wear some type of adult, adult diaper? Adult diaper, yes. And um, Now, we'll learn also that Shonda like, works with dogs and training dogs and service dogs and stuff like that. I will guarantee you, and in fact, some of the testimony that came out on the stand, that she treats the dogs better than she does any of her children, right? Probably herself. Yet, when it think to give the dog an ice cold bath, that'd be horrible. You know, can't roll my eyes hard hard enough you know and again just talks about it so nonchalantly you know that you can just tell that this was you know his mother's thing and again when they get deeper into the text messages and when we get to her testimony he, the state makes her read them yeah because she she has amnesia of course that's all you can do for this yeah but she'll go through these and there's just no denying what you were doing and fully aware of what she was doing let me ask it this way if timothy had to go to the bathroom what was, how, how would he go to the bathroom? Um, he would have to ask and he would be timed. And who would do the timing? Um, whichever one of us was there. So he'd ask, basically he asked to ask permission to go to the bathroom? Yes, sir. And what was the, t what time was he allowed to go to the bathroom? For urinating, it was a minute. Um, for, uh, you can say the word, it's okay. Taking a poop, it was <clears throat> two minutes. And who set those time limits? Shonda. Y'all. They timed the poor boy to use the bathroom. Again, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And like, oh, there was a minute for this, two minutes for this. Who made those rules up? Shonda, mom. I mean, of course, like, why would he do this, right? You know what I'm saying? And so, again, I'm just sitting here, and it's like you're watching this unfold, and it's like, oh, my gosh, who in their right mind? Like, you would have to sit here and fall in line to some degree if you're the other people in the house. Imagine what the other kids in the house were thinking and seeing this behavior take place on him. Him, they have to be afraid that it's going to be directed at them. I cannot remember this case, but they made a movie out of it where there is a woman in a neighborhood who, like, an uncle or something dropped off a niece or something like that with her. This is a while ago. Basically, she ends up having all the neighborhood boys come over and they abuse this girl. She ends up passing. But this case reminds me of this because those people, those boys, her children who are all abusing her, the actual, like, trauma that this caused to them later in life, you know, doing this stuff at the hands of this woman or whatever, and just the things that took place. I mean, it was horrifying. If you know the name of the movie, drop it down. Because I've only seen the movie. I don't remember the case, like the actual case from it. Again, it's an old one. But this completely reminds me of that. Okay, now let's get ready for the... Get your... Y'all, get your cups. You 100% need it. Because we are going to now watch Shonda take the stand. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into her testimony. Now, a couple of things real quick. First of all, trigger warning. Y'all, this is vile, the things that she's up there talking about. I didn't put a lot of the really horrible clips in here to discuss for that very reason. However, it's all horrible. So just know that we're getting ready to get into even more sensitive type stuff as if we haven't already. Okay, so let's talk about just a quick little synopsis here of a few things before we get into the clips. So she will establish that Timothy's father contacts her and he's basically like, look, I can't take care of him anymore, right? He's It's too much for me. He's pushed my buttons. Either you come get him or like he, he's getting turned over the state. Like, you know, I'm just, I'm done type thing. So there's that. So she's like, I'll take him in. So she takes him in. Now, here's the thing. Remember, Timothy has all these issues going on. And regardless if he had that going on or not, when you're transferring like states and all this type of stuff, there's just things you have to do. Also, remember, she had already towed the line 
losing custody of her children and this type of stuff before. So she will come up with an excuse for every single thing while she's on the stand. And yes, we will go over some of those, but just an overview. She's going to come up with every reason why she discontinued Timothy's medical care. Oh, well, you know, I couldn't get the, the insurance or whatever, and a legal custody was never transferred over to me. So therefore I couldn't get A, B, and C done. Now she'll translate this to healthcare, school, you name it, okay? Doesn't ever really make much of an effort to try though. Also keep in mind, and when the state rakes her over because he rakes her over, he will bring this to light. She works at the courthouse with judges and lawyers. She should be inundated with knowledge and access to all sorts of, you know, programs and knowledge about how to get to them and all this. And she'll basically only claim that she only knew about one with like Department of Health and Family Services or whatever. But, you know, they'll call her out and be like, there's this, there's that there's this there's that oh i didn't know i didn't know she didn't know a whole bunch of stuff now once timothy moves in remember her husband he ends up having a stroke so he can't work times are tight and she'll say this and she'll be like look you know money got really tight i was even going to paul asking for help for the groceries so with that being said, let's go ahead and start looking at some of those clips. And the first ones we're going to look at is her being questioned and whatnot by her own lawyer, by the defense. Now, remember, when we watch these cases, this is how this usually goes. The defense is basically questioning her to let her get her side of the story out. Again, can't believe she took the stand in this one. I'll say it a hundred times in this video. I'm sorry. I'm going to go ahead and just take a sip of from the cup of every time I say it, because as I'm watching this, I, I literally am like, what, how did she even think? think even the most narcissist of narcissists with something like this would probably be like mm -mm, I'm good I'm gonna sit this one out it's so obvious the evidence against her you, you had monitors and, and cameras in your home is that correct yes sir and the impression from the, from the testimony I heard is that it was for the purpose the sole purpose of ensuring that Timothy could not get the food was that is that accurate no why did you have all those monitors and cameras in your home? When Timothy came to live with us, his stepmother informed me that um, they had had motion sensors. Um, they weren't as tech savvy as I was. I worked in tech, before law school, I worked in tech support for several years. Um, but they had motion sensors because, she, and she told me that she didn't sleep at night. She only slept when he was at school because he was into everything. And so, because my, my younger child, he used to, when he was about two, he would take all his clothes off. So we started putting a camera in his room. And then once we moved to the Marshall Road uh, location, it was bi-level. My husband was born with a disability. Um, my husband was wheelchair bound. So he would, we had an extra wheelchair that we kept on the upper level. That's where the master bedroom was. Um, but that way, if, the, if little man, if G was down in his bedroom, my husband could talk to him through the camera and have him come up. It was much easier. My husband could crawl down the steps before the stroke, but he didn't. We didn't want him to have to crawl up and down those steps. Okay. Uh I mean, my God, there's so much going on there. First of all, her demeanor, just the look on her face, is so intense. Now she does claim that she has some situations going on with like ADHD stuff like this. Now I'm not sure. We talked about this in some of the chat stuff because she seems like if if I didn't think she was in jail or know that she was like incarcerated or whatever, I would say she was on like Adderall or something like that. Just that level of intensity that she has. I don't think they give that to you in jail because I would think that that would be like a highly possibly abused type thing in jail. But maybe they give her something else because she seems so intense. Intense. And all I can think of when I'm watching this is I'm like, imagine her being at home and angry at you with that level of intensity. The kids must have been deathly afraid of her. Now we hear in this clip that she's talking about this whole gamut of reasons for these cameras, right? Now keep in mind this. There is so much text message evidence between her and Paul where she absolutely contradicts everything that's there. The evidence speaks for itself. You can't talk your way out of it. Now again, time and time again, we see with these cases where they talk about how, how much the child was to handle. Oh, they're this. I have no doubt that there are some children, whether they have certain things going on or not, that are like, oh my gosh, you know what I mean? But the depths that some of these people are willing to go to, and especially Shonda, of 
the control, the punishment, the the crazy stuff that they end up doing as kids is just, it's so next level, it doesn't make sense. And to hear her talk in these normal ways, which we'll hear, and try and kind of explain some of it away, she doesn't see that. You can still see the normalization of this behavior by the way she speaks of it. Tell me, did, did he like to take things apart? Oh yes, absolutely. Can you He's... give some examples? Um, he took batteries apart, he took toys apart, my, my youngest son's toys. Um, he, if he could get a hold of anything from Paul's room, he would take like, mostly it was Legos, Paul still had Legos. Um, <clears throat> he, at one point, um, messed with our water heater. What do you mean? Uh, he actually turned the gas off to the water heater. Um, he, he knocked out the pilot light and then turned the gas off as well at different points. Okay. Were you, did you have any concerns as to whether or not this, his, his predilections, his, his desire to get into things, might be a safety hazard for either him or somebody else in the home? Extremely. I was extremely concerned about that, yes, sir. So it is... It Here's my thing. You know, and again, I try and not sympathize with her, but I look at both sides of it and being like, okay, imagine a normal parent talking about, oh my, that doesn't do this kind of stuff, right? It's like, oh my gosh, our kid, yeah, they're getting into everything. You know, they got into their brother's room and did this and, you know, blah, 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 you know, kind of a thing. But then when you listen to someone like Shonda get up here and talk about this, you, it's like she's listening off the reasonings for her actions. Like, well, he did A, B, C, and D. Well, he even took the, the hot water, he turned the gas off. You know, he did this. You know, and so I guess to me, I'm like, okay, well, wherever that is, I mean, if that's an issue, because you're like, yeah, say you have a problem child that's going to turn the hot water here, whatever. Well, I mean, can we maybe lock the door to that and not instead locking the child away? It, it's almost like you can just see the way she's talking right here where it's like, he was the problem. He was the focus. And she probably exaggerated that to the other kids in the house. Like, our life would be better if... He didn't do this. Now look at what he did to your stuff. Now, I, I don't know. I wasn't in the household. But just hearing the way she talks and whatnot, it's the vibe I get. So we're talking about 12 hours away from the home. Yes, sir. Okay. Those, those, those monitors, um, uh, the video cameras in your home, you were able to, or to, re, to view them <clears throat> while at work? From my phone. Occasionally, yes, sir. Okay. Um... Now, we already know that her boss, the judge, they were complaining about how much she was glued to these cameras. She was on them all the time. And again, her text, the way she makes, oh, occasionally I could look at, no girl, you were glued to these. It was like she was fixated. Now, she will say that she's OCD and all this stuff. And again, probably totally legitimate. And you can see where she's, it's like that's her focus. Unfortunately, Timothy became the focus of all of these things with her. Now, here's the other thing too, with the camera thing, like you're talking about, my husband's with the wheelchair and all this type of stuff. Those are legitimate. I get that. I have cameras all over here just for this little thing back here, right? So that I can check in during the daytime if somebody's not in the house, whatever. And make sure that he's okay do i hear howling all that i get that right in this day and age cameras it is what it is right so the camera thing i get but her utilization and why and how she was using them is where the issue is i mean when you're talking about putting cameras in the bathrooms we're gonna hear a testimony here in a little bit she had the mother-in-law on a tracking device i mean she had a lot of dark secrets and that's where it becomes obvious and again that's where i look at both sides of it where i'm like okay it's normal for people to have we got ring cameras cameras, we got this, we got that. Then you have this over here. And hearing her talk about some of these things and just outright lie, number one. She just outright lies many times. And we'll hear as we go. The only way she can get out of this is talking about, I don't remember. That was, you know, I had PTSD. I don't, I, it's, uh, it's foggy. Girl. And now, okay, drink it from the cup. It was just, it was much harder to function with, with so little sleep. Okay. And you talked about your other your other personal disorders. Were you seeking medications for those? Um, I was for, um, I had, I have severe attention deficit hyperactivity disorder combined type. Um, I also have sensory processing disorder and OCD. Um, and then after my husband's stroke, as a result of my husband's stroke, because I viewed him, I, I, I wasn't in the room when he had the stroke, but I, it was, I was there right afterwards. And so I developed post-traumatic stress disorder with disassociation from that. The only medication that I was on was for the ADHD. Now, here's the thing. She talks about these disorders. Now, notice 
she has a lot of the same ones that Timothy does. And so I'm sitting here and I'm just like, well, do you feel like the treatment you gave him was the same treatment that you need? You know, I mean, that's what blows my mind with these cases and especially this where it's like, you should then have an understanding of where he's coming from. If you were the successful academic scholar, you went out, you got this like little fancy lawyer job, passed the bar, all this type of stuff with these conditions. Well, my God, what a better role model she could have been to help some else through this especially her own blood right instead of doing the, the what she did to him okay now another thing remember how i talked about how she had a, a, an excuse for everything and whatnot and this is like just a, an example of this where here she is she did so well in school and all this type of stuff so timothy moves up we were gonna put him in school you know but we, we tried to get him enrolled in public school but because you know i didn't have the legal uh guardianship and then you know he had damaged a chromebook back in oklahoma and his dad or whoever they still owed money on that so they weren't going to release the records and then it just kind of stops and that's as much effort as we're going to put into it so then what they do is we you know I went online and found a curriculum, a homeschool curriculum, okay? Well, then we hear testimony. I don't know if I have the clip of it, but we will hear testimony where he eventually is like, he can't get a line to do the courses anymore, so they just print something out like worksheets. You know, and this is a schooling, and I'm sitting here, I'm like, but you yourself did so well in school and did all these things you know, why not help translate that to your son? And I have no doubt that people have a lot going on, but again, you just see the, 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 whatever, the mounding effect of it becomes this mountain of, you know, you could have gone and gotten these resources. You work at the courthouse, you work with these agencies probably, or have direct access to them. You know, probably better access than like a normal citizen might, right? Being like who she works with and whatnot. And it's like, you could have gotten something hooked up, some kind of thing to like help, you know? <laughs> but instead, he's just cut off from every resource outside of the home and kept prisoner. Okay, there are there <clears throat> leg irons discovered in your home. Were you aware of those? I was aware that Paul had them. Um, you actually could look on my Amazon. Paul had the option to do payment on the Amazon as well as mine. Uh -huh. And Paul had actually ordered those under his, his account. Okay. You did not order the leg irons? I did not, no. Did you, did you ever use them? No, sir. No, uh, I never instructed. Let's be in specific. Did you ever use them with Timothy? No, sir. Okay. Okay, two things. First of all, throws the son under the bus. No, he can order those. We have two two things he those are Paul's Paul ordered those you know so okay so Paul and I mean again if he goes to trial I'm not sure if he's pleading out or if he's gonna go to trial on the reduced charges you know but uh, again okay well I'd be curious to find out what's it did he just on his own order these restraints now the state when he interviews her or questions her he'll shoot this down because there's plenty of evidence of she knew about this she knew full well about this which is what again where I'm like not only did she take this to trial but she got on the stand you know and then tries to lie her way out and I'm like girl the F F no you know there's it's it's in black and white writing you know you knew about this and now you're lying about it it's not a cute look I, I don't know why we would order I mean I saw the ties I don't I don't remember ordering them I don't know what happened there you're gonna say I don't remember a lot aren't you unfortunately yes because of the dissociation okay I mean y'all again just IV the can't roll my eyes hard enough cop. Okay, I just need to hook the, the thing up. Uh, unfortunately, yes, I'm not gonna remember a lot. It's the, the, the dissociation. How convenient. Now here's the thing, her attorney will go into this line of questioning about the disassociation and the state's like, uh-uh, nope, we need the jury out of here, we gotta talk, we gotta talk. The state will proceed to read her for filth, okay? And basically be like, they've doctor shopped all around trying to find a doctor to say that she's got A, B, and C that could have contributed to this and they can't find one to do it. <laughs> they can't find one to do it, right? And so we don't want him up here questioning this line of question, he's like trying to slide something in and we, we're not down with that okay so then the state's also like and in fact if they do try and get up here and talk about that we got somebody on standby back here that's gonna blow that all out of the water talking about this ain't it, it's not even real for her okay so they're like choose your words wisely basically for certain things um, if she wants to say she just can't remember I, I guess she can just say she can't remember but she doesn't get to use the excuse that this is disassociation furthermore I have, I have a doctor still on standby as a potential rebuttal witness who did examine Ms. Vandar. It's the report from the Forensic Center, which, which Mr. Johnson has, which essentially 
debunks this entire disassociation uh, uh, myth that she doesn't remember things or chooses not to remember things because of some disassociation. So I, I'm objecting to this entire line of questioning. It's an inappropriate, essentially, defense that's being raised here. It's, it sounds like it's almost like a diminished capacity type defense. Amen, brother. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I would have loved to see the doctor get up there and talk about it. You know, and just get up there and just be like, look, this is ridiculous. This is the thing. When people get up here and let's say this, I 100% understand she's trying to get out of trouble, right? I get that. I mean, I'm not dumb, okay? You know, of course she's going to want to. Nobody is going to want to voluntarily just go to jail, right? Okay, this is, we get it. But when they go to these levels of like claiming these, you know, like, oh, that's disassociation. Oh, that's this or that. It gives such a bad name to people who legitimately experience these things and don't use them as a crutch or as an excuse for their life because some of her behavior you'll see like oftentimes we do see with people like this when their backs against the wall they'll just start these tactics of emotional manipulation for other people because they don't know how to deal with it because they go through life using these things oh so i don't you know, that was my disassociation so i don't remember punching you you know this kind of a thing right people who usually truly experience these type of things don't use them as crutches and excuses excuses at least that's been my experience i know that that's not you know everybody's experience but that's what i've typically have seen myself and so that just adds like a little bit more salt to the wound on stuff like this where she's going to legitimately sit here and try and say after all these text messages which we'll see her read some of them you know that oh sorry i, I was disassociated i don't remember doing that to my son get out of here now however once they do get all the sword and whatnot she kind of is better able to clarify her lack of memory Clearly organized and uh, follow through on information. Starting right after my husband's stroke, um, I started experiencing episodes where if you've ever passed out like the world closed, you get tunnel vision and the world closes in on you until you, you completely black out. It felt like I was blacking out, but I didn't actually pass out. Um, and the events that happened after that, I have no idea of what happened. I don't remember it. I. I don't know. Okay. And this happened anytime I got even a little stressed. This so happened. she's going to be talking about anytime I get a little stressed, she goes into this complete blackout state, but still functioning. Right. How did you make it through the day? Right. That would be, how did you make it through the day functioning like this? I mean, she's had all this time to cook up a lie and it's like, girl, you, no, you needed to cook up a much better one than this. Okay. I'm going to ask you about a specific, uh, email or text that you received uh, that accompanied a picture. Uh, it's, it's the one that the prosecutors given to, to, the, to the jury where that shows Timothy uh, from the chest up and then his legs. You know what I'm talking about? I have heard about it. I have not actually seen these pictures. How could, well you respond to it. How's it come? Can that be? I typed on my, we were in court that day. Uh -huh. I actually think I responded. I'm in court. Um, I scribbled out a message real quick. To, Back okay. to Paul. <clears throat> okay. So you I haven't seen the picture. We'll get to the, the stuff here a little bit, what she does when she sees the pictures. You've probably seen the viral clip of it. Okay. And again, the state shoots that down. She tries to come up with every excuse. Oh, I scrolled the thing in here. You're telling me you have a child at home, three children, pretend they don't have any kind of things going on, just normal thing. You don't scroll back in your text messages and look at stuff? You know what I'm saying? Seriously? You don't you don't do that. No. I do that just on a normal day just to make sure, you know, whatever. You know, remind myself of a conversation or whatever, let alone having a special needs child at home who I have another son who allegedly is telling me all the time of, you know, it's just, I just go by what my one son says. No, absolutely not. My under, well, I'm not gonna tell you my understanding because you don't need to know that. The question is, whose idea was it to, to, get hot sauce and to administer it to your son. The idea was originally Paul's. Okay. God bless. The idea was Paul's. I would love to have seen, well, he's probably not in the courtroom at this point. Can you imagine sitting there and hearing your mother throwing you under the bus like that? I mean, the idea was originally Paul's. She'll talk about this hot sauce like she had no idea. And again, I mean, I know I've said it a thousand times. I don't understand how she thinks the blatant lies that she's doing were ever going to fly because again the state's going to rip all this apart in a minute and on top of that pretend we went with what she said pretend the evidence was showing yeah you know what we found this evidence it definitely was paul's idea 
Why in God's name would you take parental advice when it comes to punishment from your life? I think he was like 19 at the time or something like that. Why would you even do that? Why would you even do that? It does, it makes zero sense. That's what she doesn't like. This is the thing she's not thinking. Oh, it was Paul's idea originally. You're co parenting with a child. Make it make sense. Um, I still like, I, not to the extent when I was pregnant, but that's some of that remained. But Timothy, as early as age two, he could eat a whole bag of the flaming hot Cheetos without a drink. I mean, just he could down, he, he loved spicy food. It was, okay. he used to scare the heck out of me. Y'all, this. Again, amen, drinketh. From age two, he was eating flaming Hot Cheetos with nothing to drink. I, I fell off the sofa over that one. I mean, again, this is what I'm talking about. Where she's come up with all this stuff, and it's like, girl, seriously? You're going to tell us that, that he just loved eating spicy foods. So, so this was like a reward. We had to keep making them hotter. And on that note, let's just talk for a second. If you watch TikTok or social media or whatever, and you see these challenges of people eating this super hot stuff. Okay, my threshold is jalapeno pepper. Okay, like I love jalapeno pepper flavored stuff. That's my threshold for peppers. That's where I go. If somebody was forcing me to eat like super crazy hot stuff, that sounds like Torture. Now, the sad thing is, is he was probably so hungry, even though we'll hear evidence, it's like he really didn't want to eat it. But if you're hungry enough, but again, you got to eat this, you know, hot sauce soaked bread and then you can get a normal piece of bread. Who does it? Who even thinks of that as an option, as a punishment? How does that even cross somebody's mind? And again, the way she's up there thinking she's doing something, talking about this, trying to explain it away with her defense, like, yeah, I knew I was gonna have my damn court to sit on my side. And you notice how she keeps looking over at the jury. Remember, she's she works in law. She's, I mean, she's past the bar, right? So she knows techniques to use. Like, always look at the jury when you answer your questions, this type of stuff. But she glances over, she doesn't just stare at them but she's doing her like little look you know looking at, i'm assuming she's looking at the jury because i think that i've figured out where the jury sits in the courtroom with the eye movements from other people and stuff so she might not be and that could be my mistake my bad however i feel like she is looking in their direction but of course she's not gonna you wouldn't want to make eye contact with them because you know uh, would they, they i mean they have to be looking at her like girl we're gonna reconvene we're gonna convene for like 10 minutes okay i mean come on you know like this ain't gonna take no time at all and it didn't once once you discovered that that timothy had passed uh and once the police get there do you tell them the truth i was so freaked out i was i'm sorry I'm sleeping. I've got one. I'm sorry. Thank you. You're welcome. Why didn't you tell me the truth? Why were you so free? I don't remember what my line of thinking was at the time. I was so tired. I, I don't. I don't know. I wish I had an answer for you, but I don't. Were you tired at that point? I was exhausted. I, the night before he passed, I had had less than an hour of sleep. Were you frightened at that point? Absolutely. I just. Lost my son. That last part made me want to come up over the, through the screen, y'all. I just lost my son. What did you think was going to happen? You certainly didn't care about him when you had him locked up, force feeding him hot sauce, but now you want to care about him now that he's dead, which directly affects you. Like, let's not forget that, right? That's the only reason why she's up there pretending to cry. And trust me, this is pretending to cry. I mean, this part, y'all, I, I, I was floored at the audacity. And again, like I've said, you know, in this case, other cases like this, you know, it's like they're living in their own little world, the perpetrator, the defendant, whatever. And then when it gets too far and it, you know, a death occurs, a major injury, uh, outside resources have to come in, whether it's, like I said, death or the, there's no getting around it. The child has to go to the hospital. CPS gets something. They get caught is what I'm getting at. This is when regret kicks in. This is when, oh, wait, because it affects them now. Their life is affected which again with these type people I'm in my mind I'm thinking they're thinking this still angry at the victim like ugh, I wouldn't be in jail if he hadn't moved back in here with me if I hadn't taken him back in it's his fault that's in my mind how they have to be thinking right because how else could they be thinking now of course I'm not a psychic I'm not a, a doctor or a psychiatrist or 
characters. I don't know. You know, but for somebody to be able to willingly inflict this type of stuff on their child, anyone for that matter, but especially their child, you know, and then get up here and try and feign tears about, I just lost my child. He was withered away, 69 pounds. No, you don't get the right to get up here and cry now. Is how I feel. Um, well, I, I had to get Paul to work and then I came home and um, my understanding at least was that when Paul had splashed water, he had splashed it on his face only. That's what I understood. Um, so I didn't realize he was still there. Um, and so when he when he, I got home, I was like, wait a second, what the? So I, I decided to go ahead and run a warm bath just to, to. There's, there's... What she's talking about in this clip is the day when he passed. He had been in a, a cold bath. This was one of the punishments was a cold bath. And Paul had put him in a bath for like several hours. Paul had to go to work, but his bike or whatever broke down. So basically she comes home and takes him to work and then comes back home. Now, first of all, I hear her. Oh, I thought he was splashing water on his face again the state will make her read the text messages where she is clearly talking about leave him in the bath longer. She knew this was going on. Then, you know, she's like, and then I came home and realized he was there, so I ran him a warm bath, and I guess she's trying to maybe say, you know, oh, the, you know how bath water will get cold or whatever? So th this is me thinking this. Again, think of the normalization here. She's going to tell a room full of people that she took, all this is going on at the home, she comes in, doesn't check on him, drives her son to work, and then comes home to, oh, he's in the bathtub. I mean, what? I mean, that's where I'm just like, uh, 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 I mean, speechless, y'all. Oh my God, I want to shake the laptop. You know, and that's the part where I'm, and what I'm speechless over is not only the actions that she took, but the fact that she's sitting up here talking about it, like there's nothing wrong with this. You know, like, oh, well, this is what we did. Like it happens every day because it did happen every day. I mean, cannot roll my eyes hard enough at this mess. God knows, I'm all worked up on a Saturday. And so, uh, other than what he was texting you, and other than what you could see when you weren't working at, at, at your job, uh, you don't have first-hand information as to what's going on between Paul and Timothy. Is that correct? No, I would. I asked my little guy occasionally, okay. um, but Timothy never told me anything that was going on. Okay. So um, I did. I mean, I asked just because I, I, if if I had texted Paul and he seemed upset, um, then I would get home and hey, is everything okay? Um, and my my little guy. Um, honestly, I don't remember him ever saying that there was there was an issue. He said, yeah, Paul got mad, but that was it. He never said anything happened. Okay. Let's, again, throw Paul under the bus completely, right? Now, this right here is a complete lie, and we'll hear the state in a minute dismantle this. You know, this is just, it's, it's absurd is what it is. So she's going to sit here. All this is going on. She's not going to question. She's going to ask the little man. Now, remember who she keeps referring to. They call him G, and she'll slip and say his name a couple of times. I mean, I get that would be difficult not to. Little man, she's talking about the seven-year-old that lived in the house at the time, her other child you know asking him hey what's going on this and that but again with the text message uh, evidence it just it's all out there you know so for her to just be like you know i didn't know what was going on with them this whole dynamic of trying to blame all this on paul and again i'm like this i'm like well timothy probably didn't say anything because they're all scared to death of you again look at her demeanor in court having been incarcerated for however long in this controlled environment imagine her stressed out working with three kids at home i mean I mean, we see what happened, right? I mean, we see what happened, but imagine the wrath that these boys went through on a daily basis. They lied to me a lot. Um, so I went back to Timothy. I said, "Somebody, nobody else has touched this. He said, I ate them. I said, okay, did you cook them? He said, no, he ate the whole two-pound bag frozen, okay. uncooked chicken. All right. Were you concerned about his health and getting into and eating frozen food? Yes, and um, he ate, um, there was a time where he ate uncooked bacon out of the fridge before the chicken nugget incident. He ate a whole pound of uncooked ground beef at one point. Um, this was all after the stroke when there was less people to keep an eye on. Did it occur to you he's doing those things because he's hungry, he's starving? No, he, I mean, he, there was plenty of food. We were, there was no issues. He never told me he was hungry at the time when these incidents happened. Okay, she will double down on this when the state gets up there. 
And so again, this is the reason for the food and whatnot. Here's the thing, because I've seen this situation play out in, in environments where there is truly a situation of we have to monitor food type thing with things that have gone on and whatnot, right? And so there's ways to go about this, okay? Now, the evidence will show that they were, again, food was used as punishment, withholding food and force feeding of the, the hot stuff and whatnot, you know? So this whole thing of, oh, well, he ate the, we were concerned for his health, that's a bunch of BS. Now, number one, she'll talk about raw chicken, raw chicken. She acts like he pulled out an uncooked chicken breast, you know, and ate the whole thing. I could have killed him. Well, yeah, honey, so could the cold baths and the force feeding and the starvation, which it obviously did. You know, but let's worry about some pre-cooked frozen chicken nuggets, okay? You know, he had a whole thing of bacon because he's starving. You're starving him to death. He's trying to survive and again flies over her. And I guess her attorneys had too because I would have stayed away from that conversation. I know they're trying to address stuff, but it just makes it worse because it just adds more to the story of, yeah, I bet he was. He's probably starving. You clearly clearly haven't fed him I and mean, he died of malnutrition right he was 69 pounds I'm sure he would eat anything he could get his hands on and probably ate as much as he possibly could never knowing when he would get normal food I mean they never gave him any kind of normal food this doesn't surprise me that he would eat anything at all that he could get his hands on at any moment why would you offer him two frozen pizza rolls because the chicken was uncooked and it's dangerous I was that actually, I had a, a panic attack when he did the chicken. It was, it was terrifying. I broke down completely. So the nuggets were uncooked chicken. Yes, it's uncooked chicken. That's it. it that could have killed him. Okay. It freaked me out. And but the pizza rolls were at least cooked. Yes, that was just you reheated them. Okay. Again, this is the doubling down of this. Now, again, am I advocating that it's completely fine to go eat uncooked, you know, chicken nugget? No. Yeah, but she's acting like, it, again, it's just this whole thing. I'm like, girl, this, no. No, 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 no. Then she wants to slide in there. I had a panic attack. It bothered me. So this is what it takes for you to be concerned about him. Not sticking him in a cold bath, not making him stand up, not forcing exercise, not forcing hot sauce down his throat and other body parts. This is what it takes you know, for you to show a little bit of emotion. She said it like she needed a cookie for it. Y'all, I just want everybody to know I cared for my son for like five seconds worried about him. Thank you. I will give a speech later. Mother of the Year award, I know. You know, again, this testimony is not giving what they think it's giving okay now let's look at a few clips of the state dismantling her entire argument her entire reason for even trying to get on the stand and they were there as part a disincentive for him to do the things he wasn't supposed to do it was to let us know he was doing it too right. that way we knew what was going on but it was it was supposed to also be you're yes. not supposed to be doing this and we know when you're you're going to be doing yes. this right it was it was so he knew we would be notified and the, the doing this that we're talking about is coming out of the basement area of the home right coming upstairs in the middle of the night yes sir coming upstairs in the middle of the night yes sir so so these would only be active at night i only turned them on at night yes sir so there's no text messages in there about turning on the motion sensor during the day so we can't come upstairs i i mean i don't recall it but but you would if those are in there you would agree with me then that you were using the motion sensors to keep him downstairs even during the day, right? It, I mean, if it happened occasionally, I'm do you, just... Do you remember the text exchange about turning off the alarms so that he can go to the bathroom and then turning the alarms back on after he's done going to the bathroom? Okay, so now, again, the prosecution is going to have established that she's, you know, very intelligent. She went to law school. She did all this stuff, right? They're going to remind everyone of this because that's the thing that she'll try and... You know, it's almost like this, you know, well, I didn't know better or I had these issues or I disassociated or any of this stuff. And it's just like, mm, you're really smart. You've done really well for yourself. And let's look at these text messages. This isn't somebody who's unaware of what's going on. Now, specifically what they're talking about in the clip that we just watched is the alarms and motion sensors and all this stuff they have hooked up to his body and the house and all this, you know, and one of the things that the prosecution will bring up is that, you know, with these, uh, some of the situations that Timothy had going on is his sensitivity to noise and how this would be a form of punishment, the noises. You know, now again, she's over here talking about, I got PTSD, I got this and that, but you know, she's going to completely discount that for him. So this is what they're going back and forth with. Now, one thing to pay attention to as we watch the clips where she's 
being questioned because he is going to, I mean, remember, he's going to put her on front street. Okay. He's just very methodically ripping her testimony apart. Look at how she falls all over herself at times. She gets stumbled up. So the, the whole direct vibe that she had is now shaken. You can sense the nervousness. You can sense the backtracking that, well, if they're in there, you know, she knows that they're in there. And if she really, truly doesn't, which I don't believe that, she knows what's in those text messages. That's, and again, being somebody who works in this field, she should know, girl, they've got all that evidence on you. Why try and make it up now? You know, it's, it's not, it's just, it's not going to help, right? Take a look at, this is from the larger text messages. This is all the text messages between you and Paul. It's a few hundred, if not thousand pages. Uh, take a look at, this is page 5783, if Mr. Johnson wants to reference. The text, this, the blue is your text messages. Can you read that for the jury, please? The blue one says, my big, my bigger issue is that you said you checked every minute or so, but checking on the camera would have told you he wasn't listening. I'm not absolving him of responsibility by a long shot, but there are reasons the cameras are in place. What time was that sent? Uh, 4.14 p.m. it looks like. So at 4.14 p.m. you're upset with Paul because he's not watching Timothy every minute on the cameras, right? If I remember correctly, that particular day, yeah, he said he was going to check. That, that wasn't, I didn't expect him to check every day, but there were days that were much more challenging, and that was when I asked him to keep a closer eye on him. Where's the text message that Okay, notice at the end of that, her mouth, moves. I mean, she's going through it, okay? She knows her goose is cooked. This alone right there, and I love that he's making her read them, right? Because you'll see, she can't deal with the reality of what she did. Like, she can't she can't deal with it, okay? <laughs> she's just like, can't do it. it. It's right there in black and white. She, she, the thing she just said she didn't do, bam, 4.30. Not only are you telling and instructing Paul, you need to watch him. What's going on? He's not going to be absolved of this, you know, and this, that, and the other. It's 4.30 in the afternoon. You know what I mean? Like, she's, they're locking him down in this room and never letting him come up. Do you go to counseling for, for, for you, or did you go to counseling for, for you? Not for that, no, sir. Um, for any of your other issues, though? I have over time. Right. It's been a long time. Um, but in fact, the entire time Timothy was in the state of Michigan, you never took him to a counselor or a doctor to address any of those issues, did you? No, sir, I didn't have insurance, the insurance information. You didn't reach out to any resources in the community that might have been available to help, did you? I, I did actually contact... Yes or no? Did you reach out to any resources yes. in the community? Which ones? I contacted DHHS about uh, getting on Medicaid, but they said that because he had other insurance, that would be primary, so we still had to have that information. Did you reach out to Community Mental Health, or Health West, I guess it's called now? I didn't. I wasn't aware of it. I didn't. I, I hadn't heard of Health West until I started working in the courthouse. Right. You worked in this courthouse, in the county that you live in, for at least the entire summer, as I recall correctly, you, you, and you never knew that we had a, a, a mental health agency here, here in Muskegon County? I didn't realize that's what it was for. I, I honestly, I didn't think about it. I re the only, as far as resources go, the only thing that I thought about was DHHS for things like Medicaid and food stamps. Again, this is the part that you're like, if you had a child that was this much trouble to you at home, that had legitimate diagnosis, stuff like this, that's number one, going off all his medication, you know, number one, not getting any kind of services, not any any kind of doctors, none of that. So well, what do you expect if you've taken him all off all his stuff? Of course, his behavior is going to flare up yeah, because you'll say he was a zombie on the medication. Now, I'm not trying to advocate for making your kids a zombie on the medication and stuff, but I'm like, okay, so your logic was then take him off all of that his behavior's out of control and then we'll just beat him into submission you know but then to hear her oh i didn't think about that i, I didn't think about that working with the guy i didn't think about that what were you were you too busy you know doing what you did to him to think about actually helping him you know again this is a testimony where you can start to see it all over her face where she's like oh wait maybe i shouldn't have gotten up here and testified you know like it never crossed her mind that she would get raked over i'm like they had to have told her she's not dumb she's got a degree in this stuff okay so that's just where the, I don't know if it's narcissism, I don't know what it is that convinces these 
people who against all odds and evidence will get up here and try and talk their way out of something. And it could be as simple as they have nothing to lose at this point. And so they're like, I might as well try. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's almost like, I know I'm going away for life. We might as well go out swinging, you know, and try and see if we can throw everything against the wall and see what sticks. But you definitely did not consult with the doctor before you did that. No, sir, because we ran out. But you, you, and again, didn't reach out to any, the, besides DHHS, didn't reach out to any resources in the community that might have helped you out with a child with such severe emotional issues that you have to use motion sensors and later alarms and locks on things. You, you didn't reach out for any resources before you just decided to stop him taking medication. Before we before you ran out, I, I wasn't aware of, like I said, I, DHHS is pretty much the main resource that I was aware of. Y'all, she should know 100% the severity of having someone, especially your child, come off of these type medications. No, I didn't think of it. We couldn't get, I didn't have the insurance info. Okay. And again, this is where she just, it's almost like she's sinking into the chair because it's like maybe for the first time she's hearing herself. I mean, the jury has to be over there like, are you kidding me? Uh, you know, I mean, seriously, it, it's almost like she was so lazy. She couldn't even come up with a better excuse to lie. You we went to great lengths to make sure that the grandmother, that's Grammy, that's the person Grammy, you referred yes. to as Grammy, right? Your mother-in-law. You went to great lengths to make sure that she wasn't allowed in your home, didn't you? I mean, that was just because the house was a mess. Did you have some type of tracking device on her to know where she was? Um, she, we had her phone under our our phone plan, so I could look up on find my iPhone. Because usually, when she was that way, um, Paul wanted to know when she was coming to get Gabriel. Oh, gee, sorry. I don't know what to, they got Granny on a damn tracker. Paul wanted to know. Now he's getting ready to just blow this out of the water, make him read another text message. Uh, he has moved around, so he got the cuffs in front of him instead of behind him. Go ahead and flip the page and read the next one. Uh, I put the cuffs back behind him. I will have to deal with less than two hours of sleep today, but not letting him get away with this BS. I put the cuffs back behind him. That is your text message. Yes, sir. So you use handcuffs on Timothy? I don't remember, honestly. The handcuffs that she didn't buy. Okay, that Paul got off Amazon. Okay, this is what I'm talking about. Again, if I had been her and my lawyer was like, okay, look, here's the text message evidence they have against you. Do you wanna, what do you wanna do? Do you wanna take this to trial? Do you wanna take a plea deal? I'd be like, what deal are they offering? Okay, you can't say anything to this text message stuff. It's all right there. And the, the normalcy of it, again, is bone chilling to me. Absolutely bone chilling. Uh, oh, this is from earlier. He just won't listen or does something I didn't tell him he could. He just tried claiming his zip cuffs were too tight when I didn't even tighten them to where there's no room for his wrists. This is your response now. Yeah, leave them as they are and I will check them when I get home and you can tell him that. And if he lied about that, he gets himself in even more trouble. You want me to keep going? No, nope, that's fine. Leave them as they are and I will check them when I get home. You want to revise your earlier answer to the question when you said that you would have said, oh, no, don't use zip cuffs on Timothy. I don't recall that, sir. I'm sorry. Don't recall that either. Huh? No, sir. Good. Literally all you can say. I don't recall. That's literally, you can just see the look on her face. She's already formulating here that I, I ain't coming back tomorrow. <laughs> She's already formulating that. There's nothing else you could do, right? There's nothing else you could do. I would have wanted to get up and walk off the stand if I was her at that point. Because again, thank God for, I love prosecutors like this who come with these receipts and call this BS out like this. I mean, because it's so blatant. It's almost a slap in the court's face, like this one right here, where it's like, girl, it, it, why even try and get up here and make this stuff up you, you said right here that you're doing this stuff and yet now you're going to say this and then take the cowardly way out by trying to blame it on some you know oh it's a mental situation that i have going on i have no recollection of doing these horrible things to my son absolutely not and drinketh from the cup oh let's keep going and i said i hear you give pb sandwiches and water you want me to keep going yeah okay the unresponsiveness is probably fake but i see what you mean okay. and go ahead and the next page uh, also, it's no wonder he's hardly capable of standing. 
then that's the one with his photographs of his legs, right? Yeah, and then I said, I'm in court. So was it really your testimony that you never saw that photograph? I do not recall seeing it. I, that was it. I feel like I want to throw up. You don't recall seeing the photograph, right? No, sir. The unresponsiveness is probably fake, but I see what you mean. You literally use the word see in your text message about see what you mean. But your testimony today is, I didn't, I didn't look at the photograph. I didn't see the photograph. Yes, sir. That's, I mean, it's a phrase that you use. It's a phrase that you use? I see what you mean? Yes, sir. Isn't that usually when you see the things that the people are talking about? Sometimes. Mm. I'm wondering why your response to your son saying that your other child is bone thin and needs to eat, actually feed him. That's the phrase. Actually feed him. Oh my God, y'all. I'm literally cringing so hard over here. Okay, let's talk about the last thing, first of all, because it's heartbreaking. Actually feed him. That was how he was treated. Treated dogs better than her own child. Actually might have to feed him. I shudder to think what the pit. I didn't even want to see the pictures. I, I shudder to think what they look like. Now on that note, again, see how he walks you through there. It, you literally say, I see in the picture. Well, no, but that's just a phrase. You know, th this level of where these perpetrators don't want to look at the outcome of their crimes or have anything to do with that part of it, it just disgusts me. Because again, I'm sitting here thinking, and this is the heartbreaking part for Timothy, is in addition to the physical, mental, emotional stuff that he was going through at their hands, is the process of dying, you know, and leading up to that, because, you know, dying is this kind of death is slow, you know, and so he was barely hanging on and it got worse and worse and worse and worse and the punishment kept going and going and going oh he's making it up it's not real i'll punish him worse we might actually have to feed him you know and then her to get there i think i'm gonna throw up and this is what i'm talking about her back's against the wall she doesn't know what else to do she can't lie she can't squirm so now she's gonna start doing physical things physical things to get out of the accountability if that's what you say the text messages say well, you just read the one that said he can have four, and then he can wait 30 minutes, and then he can have some without hot sauce on it. You read that one, right? Yes, sir. But again, you don't remember sending that text message. No, sir. But aliens didn't take a hold of your phone and take over your body or anything like that, did they? No, sir. No. Mr. Johnson didn't ask you, so I'll just go ahead and ask you. You used a number of other physical methods of punishing Timothy, didn't you? It's a fine number. Yeah, okay. Two, you made him do wall sits. Uh, one time, and that was Paul's suggestion as well. He said, oh, this, this used to drive me crazy. Um, I guess he said that, Paul said that his dad and stepmom had used that as a punishment with him. And so we decided to give it a try and Timothy could have cared less. Again, we're back to, we decided to give it a try. She doesn't understand what this sounds like to the normal ear. You and your 19-year-old son decided that this was the punishment that was going to be okay. You know, oh, well, Paul decided, again, after she throws him under the bus for it, you know, we decided this, but he he, he didn't care. Yeah, he didn't care. We just had to turn up the, the volume on the punishments. You know, blows my mind. Blows my mind. Bottom text. I wonder how it would feel to have that hot sauce on your private parts. I'm not saying touch him there, not at all, but dripping a little bit there is that horrible. Did you have to ask that question? I wouldn't think so. I don't remember that. I can't even imagine saying that. But you did. I know, but I can't even imagine it. About your child, right? Who at that point was in the middle of an ice bath that lasted at least two and a half hours at that point, right? I can't even imagine saying that. It's her text message. And this is what I'm talking about. I mean, the shame of it, if she's able to feel that. I mean, that is so next level. I'm not saying you have to touch him there, but you know, is it horrible to sprinkle some down there? Now, Paul would testify that he refused to do this. I mean, thank God, right? So there is that level of that of Paul, you know, th there's a certain line even for him that he's gonna stand up to her and be like, I ain't, I'm not doing that, right? Maybe that was seemed like, maybe he felt it was more normal to force feed the hot sauce as opposed to putting on the genitals. Because this is getting into some dark, twisted stuff that was already dark and twisted to begin with, right? It was not a far jump to get down into just 
truly psychotic behavior. Okay, so with all that, let's see how she reacts when everything is just put in front of her. Here is what you've done. What does she have to say? This is hours before he dies, right? Yes, sir. You look like that when you put him in the bathtub? Now, I don't want to get too deep into it because I can't take that myself. Yeah, first of all, I don't think she's really throwing up. There's nothing you can say. Here's the evidence of what you did. This is your son hours before he died. Now, she's trying to play it off like, I've never seen these pictures before. I must have disassociated. So she's trying to act like this is the first thing. I think in her world, she's trying to go with the whole, th the whole level of, I don't remember this. It was Paul that did this. I'm not accountable, you know, kind of a thing. And so maybe that was her motivation for this of, well, I'll just do this and I'm going to throw up because again, there's nothing you could say to this, right? There's just literally nothing you can say. It's right in front of you. You're done. Okay. Literally. Now let's talk about this. What do you do after you have had a day on the stand like this? What is there a left to do? Well, let's see how she handles it the next day. To work with her and hopefully get her to the point where she can come in and participate in her own trial. Uh, I must report to the, to the court at this point that that, that situation has not occurred. Uh, that she at this point is not able to, to, to participate uh, in trial uh, given this medical situation. Uh, that uh, uh, as a result of that, uh, she's been basically we, we, we've gone over a couple of options. One, ask for to adjourn this this case until a later date. But uh, quite frankly, the, the situation that brought on this medical situation is occurring and is part of the stress of being on trial. So basically, she ain't coming back. Okay, and she did not come back. Now, you can only imagine how this would look to the jury. Now, what we're seeing here is a quick snippet, and this took place outside of the jury. Obviously, they discussed, you know, saying that she had a medical issue, this and the other. I, I think everybody can probably read between the lines. I would love to know what the jury said once they got out and, like, kind of watched the stuff and saw what was going on out of their eyesight. Um, because obviously, at the time of this recording, this has already happened. She's, you know, the verdicts come through and all that so like i said at this point there honestly there was nothing left for her to do but waive her right to be there you know and come up with some bs thing of like i'm disassociating or i'm doing this she knew the writing was on the wall she can't face these same people it's too much and i mean literally i i mean this is what she should have done in the first place she should have taken a deal and saved everybody her son from having to testify all this and that you know the whole nine yards yeah so to take this again cowardly way out of being held accountable facing her actions it, it's very on brand for her now let's go ahead and move on into the closing arguments and we're just going to focus on a couple of clips from the state the state will sum up it's some very powerful but methodically spoken the way he does aspects of this trial to really hit home with the jury send them off with some imagery and some last thoughts of what Timothy went through at the hands of who was supposed to be his mother. I usually like to start opening, or excuse me, closing statements in a homicide trial such as this by showing you a photograph. And that photograph is usually the victim in the case prior to their death. In this case, our victim was a child. Would hope to be able to show you a photograph of what he looked like within a few months of his death. We can't do that. I can't do that because the defendant apparently took it upon herself to make sure there were no photographs taken of the victim in the six months leading up to his death. Now, again, this is what's so sad, and he'll speak of this. And I mean, if you're a parent or really anybody, you know, that has loved ones, you know, you know, you're, there's usually pictures of these people on your phone, especially your kids on some level, no sign of Timothy. Now, of course, she doesn't want to take pictures of him. Number one, she probably obviously, his testimony shows and evidence, she can't stand him. Number two, she doesn't want to document her crime, right? She threw up at the pictures of him. 
of you know the result of her actions you yeah, know but again this is very powerful for the prosecutor to line this up this way of there's no pictures to show you we don't have those to show you of what he looked like before his death because his mother went out of her way to make sure that didn't happen also the mother-in-law we have her on a tracking device we know when she's coming here we're monitoring the house who can see it and who's you know can't yes the house was messy but there's also this going on in there and that ultimately she couldn't let anybody have any chance of ever seeing what they were doing to Timothy. He stole some food. He took some things apart. That's all I heard. And he paid for that with his life. Now, this was another powerful aspect that the prosecutor brought up in the closing statements and asking, which is something we would all wonder, what were Timothy's crimes? What did he do that was so horrible that it elicited this type of response, this type of punishment? And like he said, stole some food, it took some things apart. I mean, literally, you're just like, this is all it took? can't imagine what would happen to uh, if real drama occurred right and we'll talk about some of that some of my thoughts on what i think with the other children in the house and their viewpoint on having to live with her and scenes and whatnot when we get to the end but for now let's look at a couple more of those clips from the closing arguments that alone evidences a guilty state of mind ladies and gentlemen but you don't need that you don't need much more than these text messages to prove that shonda vander ark is responsible because she intended to kill, because she intended to do great bodily harm, or she at least created a situation so dangerous that death or great bodily harm was a result to her child, Timothy Ferguson. And I will ask you to return a verdict of guilty, a first degree felony murder, a first degree child abuse. Amen. Again, he summed this right up. And again, if you remember and go back to the beginning of the video, the beginning of the trial, when the defense was essentially trying to line out like intentional and, you know, intent and knowledge and all this type of stuff, looking at the evidence again, I'm like, why would that even be your defense? But again, in his defense, there was nothing you could do. We already heard from the state that like, look, they doctor shop, they can't find anybody to diagnose her with something, right? you're literally hanging on to a thread of, I mean, what do you say? There's nothing to say to it. There is no defense. She told on herself with those text messages, you know, the only thing the jury could do was return these guilty verdicts, right? Now, again, in this day and age, you never know what's going to happen, right? I mean, my God, we've seen things go sideways at the last minute. You never know with a jury, you know, but this was one of those that I would have been shocked if they did anything but return a guilty verdict. And in fact, let's look at a quick clip of that. Apologies. Okay, all right. That's okay. The people of the state of Michigan versus Shanda Van Ark, count one, charging open involving the death of Timothy Ferguson. We find her guilty of first degree felony murder. Count two, first degree child abuse. We find her guilty of first degree child abuse. Good on you, jury. Now, during the judge's final remarks to the jury, he will note the absolute heinousness of this crime, the imagery that they saw, the things that they witnessed. It kind of makes me tear up a little bit to even think about it. Uh, number one, what Timothy went through, but also look at all the victims of this case the other children in the house, the community, the officers that arrived, the jurors that have seen this. Can you imagine? Especially you have kids at home and you're going and listening to this stuff and seeing her on that stand and then you're going home. And I mean, if they had kids, you know they're just hugging onto those kids when they get home, right? Because you see what's out there and it's so frightening and it's so scary and it's so heartbreaking to realize like, you know, my gosh. Now again, notice she ain't there. She can't even show... She knew it was going to be guilty, you know, as most of us did, right? But again, you never know till the jury comes out and says, you know, but she couldn't handle that, you know, at all. So she's doing it from the comfort of her cell or wherever she's at. Now, as we saw, she wasn't present as we discussed, but she will have to come to her sentencing when that takes place. I personally don't think she'll ever see the light of day. I mean, the judge remarked about how horrible this crime was. Many people have spoken that have worked directly with it. Uh, this is one of the worst they've seen. And obviously us as onlookers from it, 
I can agree with this, right? This is some of the worst of the worst here. Now, let's take a minute and talk about final thoughts with this. You know, first of all, my heart goes out to Timothy and these other victims such as him, really victims all uh, across the spectrum of ages and whatnot, but especially these younger victims that they have spent their childhood, however short that might have been, whether one year old, five, 15, whatever. You know, but that was their experience here on earth was this at the hands of someone who's supposed to be their parent, someone who's supposed to unconditionally love them. You know, and this was their experience. It's absolutely heartbreaking to see take place. You know, another other thing that's heartbreaking is to see the siblings in the house. And as I spoke earlier, you know, I'm very curious to see what ends up happening with Paul. You know, my take on it was that he was very afraid of his mother. Now, the age that he was at, and yes, there is some you know, truth to be told. And you know, he did say no to her over one thing. You know, there were opportunities for him to do things. However, on that same note, looking at her behavior and how severe she is in this setting, I can only imagine the mental control she had over the other people in the household. So, you know, with Paul, you know, again, I come back to this. Do I think he possesses the same evil that his mother does? No, I do not. You know, do I agree with the actions that he did? No, I do not. It's very, very complicated complicated when it comes to him. And I'd be very curious to see what happens to his case. Again, you know, he took a, a deal basically to get reduced charges to testify against his mother. You know, and as we heard, he placed the blame on her. He seemed very afraid to be in the courtroom with her. You know, he spoke about this was at the direction of her and he'll have to maneuver his way mentally through what he's done. You know, this is a whole other thing. Now, also we had a seven-year-old in the house. Imagine this child, what that child is thinking. Because again, when she's away, all the kids are at home alone. So there's no telling what was really going on that never made it back to her. So the other child is going to have survived through this and seen this and have questions about this, what, you know, he might not remember or does remember as he gets older and grows. You know, again, going back to the homeschool thing, I, I don't know. And again, I'm not, I, I don't, I it wasn't homeschooled. I'm not sure how it works. I'm not sure if you homeschool, is there no one absolutely that can check in on a child. The thing with particular situations like her is she slipped through the cracks. Remember, she was supposed to have had her rights taken away from her at one point, but she left the household to avoid that happening and she moved. She was very good at moving around to avoid accountability. We see what she did when she's like a little rat trapped. She feigns illness. She throws up. I'm having a mental breakdown. I can't show up. You know, you name it. She's going to do it. You know, we see it play out here. So you can only imagine when she was out in the streets, how she was much a you know better able to manipulate and get out of things she didn't want to do or be held accountable for there's plenty more excuses to go to you know i'd be curious to know what if any reaction she had when she got news from jail if she was surprised at the verdict i don't think she would be because obviously she didn't show up right so i hope she doesn't see the light of day you know i, I hope she, she doesn't ever need to be let out again i mean somebody who would hold captive their child and do these things and have another child in the household inflict these things on that child d no absolutely not bottom uh, beneath the jail as far as i'm concerned so i'm curious to know what you think obviously about the whole case in general i'm especially curious to know your take on paul because this is such a complicated dynamic of the case you know do you think he needs to be you know charged with what he was charged do you think that he's a complete victim do you think he's needs to be held partially accountable like what are your thoughts on it because this case is like this they're all very unique and especially when another child is involved in the abuse of how cold Culpable. I can't say that word, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, they were in the matter. So I'm curious to know your thoughts on that. Now, again, if you're still watching, thank you. I know this was a long video, but I just, I mean, there was so much to discuss with this. So if you still are watching, I appreciate it. And Roscoe says, thank you. He got bored of sitting back there filming. He was like, dad, we come on and i needed my emotional support dog as we got deeper into the stuff and closer to the verdict i was like i need my little emotional support dog thanks dad can you don't forget about the sofas I almost forgot to ask you, could you drop some sofas in the comment section for Roscoe? When he's ready to go sit back down on the sofas, he'll bring me with him and we'll meander down to the comment section. But until we do that, we'll, we'll see y'all soon. 